Today is Christmas. He, uh, he got a truck. At least when I'm filming this, it's Christmas. There's a good chance this will go up like the weekend after Christmas takes place, but I wanted to talk about the 64 today, mostly because it is Christmas 2019, which means it has now been 20 years since I opened up my Nintendo 64 in uh, 1999, and it was a very exciting time. And a little while ago, a few days ago, we had a Christmas with one part of the family, and my nephew really wanted some Switch games, and he was so excited to open up Mario Tennis, it kind of reminded me of the old days when you'd get that one gift that you really, really wanted, specifically for me, game systems, uh, and you get so excited, that childlike excitement. It gave me a little bit of a, a nostalgia, a little bit of flashback there to when I opened my 64. It was a bit of a buildup. So today I want to take a look at a premium refurbished blue Nintendo 64, the clear turquoise model from GameStop to see how it is, of course, because people like to see how those show up anyway and what what uh, condition they're in. And I figure we talk a little bit about the history of me, the Nintendo 64, uh, at Christmas time. And let me know down in the comments about any big gift, I guess, you got at Christmas that was really exciting to you, whether it was a, I guess, a game system or a game, something video game related uh, down below. You know, I've always had a soft spot for the Nintendo 64. Back during the 90s, there was a lot of buildup around the release of the Ultra 64, and I was there along for the entire ride. We really weren't too sure what Nintendo was going to release, and outside of several rumors, with some being passed around online on early message boards, the power of the system was exaggerated in some corners and underestimated in others. See, it turns out, not everything online is true. This was something we didn't really know back then because it was still kind of new to be online and talking about video games on forums. So video game rumors were still around back then, right? I mean, you hear about video game myths like pushing the truck to get Mew, but building up to that Ultra 64 and kind of the mystery around it, it was pretty easy to plant some rumors online and have them spread like crazy around Angel Fire, I think, and like several other sites where you could post like bulletins and there were of course forums. It was, uh, a bit different because things were so new. Now we know, okay, be careful with rumors and all that, but back then, we didn't know what was real and what wasn't. In May of 1996, Nintendo revealed a ton of information about the N64 to US gamers with an initial price of $250 and games that they could expect to release during that launch window of the system. That price was eventually changed to be more competitive with the PS1 and Saturn releasing $50 less at $200. There's still a bunch of articles and press releases you can find online that date back to that day in May of 96, where they talk about how powerful the system is and all of the features the controller had packed in. I also noticed they discussed the N64 DD and that it would be sold separately, showing Nintendo really did have plans to launch the attachment out west. Oh, and don't worry, I didn't forget about that N64 DD that I have right now. We'll look at it just another time. Needless to say, I was very, very hyped up over the N64. I remember the mall in my area was holding an event to show off Mario 64 in person, and you could even wait in line to get hands on with the game ahead of release. This was a weekend event, and I remember going, but not getting a chance to play it. The line was way too long, and it would have taken hours just to get near the system. They at least had a large display above the kiosk, and I was able to get my first look at Mario jumping out of the warp pipe and running around the castle. It was absolutely mind-blowing, and that's just putting it lightly. So, that Christmas, I asked for a Nintendo 64 and a copy of Mario 64, but there was just one problem. It was pretty much sold out everywhere. Like, you couldn't find the Nintendo 64 in 96 that Christmas. It was so difficult to get it, seriously. So, I ended up basically figuring out I wasn't going to be getting it, and instead, I got a Super Nintendo that turned out to be my cousin's old system because they ended up getting the 64. So I ended up with their uh, system. But what was really cool about that, and I look back on it now, because I was such a Genesis kid at the time and I was interested in the Super Nintendo, but I was really looking at that 64, if I had made the jump directly to the 64, I would have missed out on what ended up being probably my favorite system of all time in the Super Nintendo and that massive library of games, especially since I got it in 96 when most of the stuff was already out and then 
the following year, I was all about that Super Nintendo. I'm actually kind of glad, technically then, that I ended up with a Super Nintendo instead of a 64. And then the following year, I ended up asking for Super Nintendo games because I was so entrenched in that system at the time after getting it the Christmas before. So I asked for Mega Man X3, Chrono Trigger, and Mario RPG, and you know what? It was a pretty good year. Fast forward to the next year in 1998, leading up to Christmas, and I was set on that Nintendo 64. Well, at least until... Yeah, the US kind of caught Pokemon fever at the time. That included me and all of my friends. So that year was all about Pokemon and peer pressure. The games, cards, TV show, you name it, we all wanted it. It was a crazy time. And I don't know if Pokemon had ever been bigger. Seriously, when it hit the Western shores, people were going crazy over this series. I ended up getting Pokemon Blue, a Link Cable, and some other Pokemon related stuff that year. So you know what? It was a pretty good year again. Okay, the next year was the year. Finally, in 1999, I ended up getting the Nintendo 64. And I actually think looking back on it, I ended up getting it at a great time. Sure, the 64 was years into its life at that point, and and the PS2 was coming up soon, but getting it now meant the library of games had grown significantly and the overall system had become cheaper with bundles even being available. So that Christmas morning, I ended up opening up Pokemon Snap and an extra atomic purple controller with the standard black Nintendo 64 system. I found a picture of what I think it looked like online. I remember having to open a large plastic casing to get to the system in the game. So this should be it right here. Don't even get me started on Pokemon Snap because at this point, the fact that there's not a Pokemon Snap 2 is insane. That is a massive missed opportunity that I think anyway, that the Pokemon company and Nintendo should be taking advantage of right now. I just, I really liked the original Pokemon Snap and the fact that they've done nothing with that franchise since the 64 just really, really hurts. Now the N64 is a tank of a system, so I don't really expect much to be wrong with it in the first place. And this is probably one of the safer systems to buy from GameStop straight up. They ended up doing an all right packing job with bubble wrap all around the system and the controller. GameStop also managed to match the correct Nintendo branded controller with the system, which is something I was a bit concerned about with no picture being available on their website. You know, I have to admit, for the most part, GameStop has been pretty good with their used controllers. This N64 controller is pretty clean and appears to have been checked out with the stickers from a third party on it. The stick is always the place to start when checking one of these controllers out, and it feels like it hasn't been put through the ringer with Mario Party just yet. It, it doesn't appear to have been changed out for a different stick either. It just looks like it was taken care of by its previous owner, so that's good. Either way, GameStop continues to pass the used controller test, and with a special edition system like this, that is a relief. Power Supply is also a first-party power supply. However, it does appear that they sent me an off-brand AV cable, but this is probably the least expensive part of this whole package, so it's not really that big of a deal. A quick look at the system shows some scratching around the surface that can be seen in the right light. The overall appearance of the system is actually pretty good, however, and both the power and reset buttons are not sticky at all. If you have a Nintendo 64 and either of those buttons start to stick, it's actually pretty easy to fix it. After removing the lid, those buttons will pop right out and cleaning with some soapy water, it'll be good as new. I did notice that there was a refurbishment sticker on the bottom of the system showing that someone had opened it for some reason or another. My best guess is to clean either the reset or the power button, but we'll open it up to double check. First though, I wanted to check to make sure that the system actually worked. And in fact, I captured all of the gameplay footage in this video from this Nintendo 64, and it hasn't had any problems. Considering the system doesn't have any moving parts outside of the power and reset buttons, it's no surprise that it would be working. The systems I've received from GameStop that had issues would typically have problems with things like a laser to read discs with, for example. So a system like the Nintendo 64 is hard even for GameStop to mess up. Opening the 64 is easy as long as you have a GameBit driver. They sell packs of these online and it's worth having a bunch of sizes handy since it's a bit that shows up on a lot of systems from the 90s. After removing the jumper pack and the lid, the top of the system comes off showing us the large heatsink on top. Also, an interesting note about the jumper pack that people may not know, it didn't serve much of a purpose outside of letting the system start up. 
See, the jumper pack didn't have any RAM inside, which is something we used to think back in the day. The four megabytes of RAM is located on the board inside the system, and the jumper pack just acts like a placeholder for the expansion pack. Basically, it completes a loop inside the system that allows it to post and start up correctly, but doesn't provide anything beyond that. It just kind of hangs out waiting to be replaced. That's kind of a sad existence now I think about it. Anyway, with a couple of Phillips head screws removed, the heatsink lifts away, showing the motherboard. The 64 was an interesting beast in the 90s. It was touted as the first real 64-bit system, and Nintendo pushed the power narrative heavily versus the PS1 and the Saturn. The 64 used a central processing unit and a coprocessor named the Reality Coprocessor. The CPU was clocked much higher than the competition's offerings at 93 megahertz and had twice the RAM, and that's before adding in the expansion pack to double the RAM in the 64. Now, there were two big weaknesses of the 64 that are generally pointed out. One being the cartridges and the other being the unified memory inside the system. Sony had decided to divide up the memory inside their PlayStation at the time, whereas Nintendo just dropped the entire four megabytes into a pool that could be accessed at any time through the GPU. This is believed to have saved Nintendo money during production process, but because the latency was so high when calls were made to the memory, developers really had to plan things out specifically for the Nintendo 64 and develop around that weakness. The other weakness being the cartridge is widely talked about, and I've covered it somewhat already on this channel. Sony went with CDs, which were cheaper and held far more data at the cost of load times. The gamble seemed to pay off with companies like Square jumping off of the Nintendo ship to join Sony with their big flagship Final Fantasy series going forward. Well, I have to say, this 64 is fine. It works well, it has some minor scratching around it, but for the most part, it's a 20 year old system that looks, I think, pretty good overall. So, hey, good job to GameStop on this one. It's a 64 though. I kind of expected it to work considering it's pretty much a tank and the fact that it has the cover for the jumper pack and the correct controller is probably the part that I was rolling the dice on the most when there wasn't a picture there, but Hey, looks good. After getting my N64 for Christmas in 1999, I went on to rent a ton of games from Blockbuster and Hollywood Video. Getting into the N64 now meant I had a much larger library of games to pick from. Over the next year, I would do the classic rent a game on Friday and spend the next two days trying to beat it before taking it back Sunday night. It was a simpler time, and I do miss the days of driving to the store to rent a game, but now everything is delivered digitally or by a machine that may or may not give you a paper cutout of the disc. Looking back on the Nintendo 64, it may have been a boneheaded, stubborn move by Nintendo to release what they did back in 1996. It was late to the party, lacked some big third-party games, and left a lot of us wondering what could have been with a CD-equipped N64. Nintendo pretty much admitted that cartridges were not the future when moving to mini-DVDs the next generation, and then sticking with disc-based media over the next few generations of home consoles. But now, decades later, it's interesting to see how the landscape has changed. Instead of talking talking about disc-based media being the next big thing, we're talking about Nintendo going back to cartridges and solid-state drives being inside of the PlayStation 5 and the next Xbox. I mean, we've even finally seen Final Fantasy VII go to a cartridge, which was unthinkable back on the Nintendo 64 and one of the reasons that Square left completely. So yes, over the last 20 years from when I first opened my Nintendo 64 to opening this one today, things have certainly changed. However, it is interesting to watch Nintendo go back to where it all began.